Okay, so let's talk about making, um, making killer graphs, effective graphs. Um, remember the goal of this is to say how does factor A relate to factor B? Or if we have multiple factors, how does factor A relate to B and C and D, et cetera? Another way of saying that is what's your hypothesis? What are we trying to test? We're trying to, you know, you, you all have predicted that this relationship between these various factors exists. So use your graph to interpret that. Let's see if that's really happening or not. We already did this before, so I'll just do a quick review. But this is an exercise we did last semester, but we started with this figure that wasn't maybe the best. And we talked about how might we, with an interactive process, um, fix it. And as we said before, just like our introduction, just like our method section, just like our, our other elements of our paper, our graphs need to be revised, right? They're going to start out not great. We're going to revise it, revise it, revise it. And with each revision, we're going to make it tighter, better, more elegant. So in this case, we started with this thing and we didn't, the axes were all crazy, wasn't properly labeled. And we ended up with something like this, which was much more explanatory and much, much clearer as to what we were trying to get across. We also talked about this example, which is from the Wall Street Journal. And this was um, uh, about taxes. And this was this statement that was made about uh, taxes affecting, um, going to affect, uh, as, as the argument was made in the Wall Street Journal, uh, middle America and, uh, and not so much other folks. And so this is the figure that they put in the Wall Street Journal. And so by just glancing at that, it looks like, oh my gosh, yeah, the middle class is going to pay the most amount of taxes here. But then if you recall, when we were discussing this, we went and we looked specifically at the axis, the x-axis, and we noticed that the binning was dishonest. The binning was intentionally misleading. So the data is all real. But if you look on the lower left, for example, we're talking about you know, one to $4,000 uh, constitutes the range of a particular bin, whereas by the time we get to the right, it's more than $5 million per bin. Right? So then we went and we, we, we did a fair binning of stuff, and it turns out that, at least according to this, article, this data that was presented in the paper, the majority of, of the taxes were coming from the, the wealthier folks. So, so again, not making a judgment on whether that's right or wrong, but we want our data to be accurate. We want our presentation of data to be honest and not intentionally misleading, as I would argue this example was. Another example, not trying to beat up the Wall Street Journal, not trying to do that at all, but just this example happens to come from them. And uh, unfortunately, the, the, they don't, <laughs> they've taken this down, this data down from their site, I think, because people criticized it. So um, unfortunately, the, the, the crispness of this particular figure is a little low resolution. But, but basically, they, this was from a story. And it said, hey, where do, where do you guys like to work? Where do young folks like to work? And they, there's all these uh, you know, dozens and dozens of companies. And people said whether they thought it was a good place to work or not. And, um, and so the, the, the posture, the, the, the um, statement on the top of the paper, on the top of the story, excuse me, was young workers like Facebook, Apple, and Google. And so they presented their data in the form of a table. Now, on the face of it, there isn't necessarily anything wrong with presenting your data in the form of a table. But in this case, all they provided was the table and not a, a, a figure. And so you could search the table, which was cool, but it was clunky and hard to look at and everything. So um, let's do a, a quick um, looking at how we might organize the data differently. So firstly, on the left, you could take all that data that was in the chart and just simply plot it. And so that first one comes up on the left, and that's usually the first default, right? So it's a, it's a uh, bar graph with the x-axis being the different categories, or in this case, the different companies ranked. So from highest to lowest, or, or, or most, uh, the company with the largest preference for young folks wanting to work there to, to the lowest. And so for me, just looking at that, it's OK, but it's easier for me to take that and turn it on its side. So same exact data. Just now, instead of a up-down bar graph, it's a side-to-side -side bar graph. And for me, that one's easier to see, see the natural, see, see the existing breaks in the data. And uh, I should also say, because mostly the way our eyes look, right, our, sc our screen or our field of view or, or whatever is usually oriented that way, um, it, we can squeeze more stuff in. 
And so here's a final example of what you might do. Again, same exact data as that first data, but here now we've labeled the axes with the company's name, so it's easy to see. And we've also labeled the value, the top value of the bar uh, inside so that you can more, if you want to know the, the exact number, you can, you can look at it. So I would argue this is a more elegant way of presenting the data. It's, it's much easier for you guys to take a quick glance, look at it, aha, I see what's going on. Google, it's not just Google, Facebook, and Apple. Google is way far out. Um, Apple as well. Facebook looks a little bit more similar to the other companies by this grouping, right? You guys with me? So I would postulate that that's a more um, elegant, efficient way to communicate the data than is that. But, but neither is technically wrong. They're both, the data is there. It's just presented in a different fashion. So we might then ask, what makes something effective? What, what's, a, what's an effective way to present some quantitative information? So have a look at this, stare at this for a second and tell me what you think is going on here. Yeah, so right here. So bottom line is divided into years, the right hand line into uh, 10,000 pounds each. So this is 10 times 10,000 pounds, 20 times 10,000 pounds, et cetera. So this is, this is amount of money or, or value worth. So this is, uh, now this is relative to England. And in this particular case, it's, it's trade with uh, Denmark and Norway. And so this is the export, the, the yeah. Yeah, the export's dipping below the imports, so it's the balance against, so there's more imports than exports, so they're making less money for the country. Right, so, right, so here, so in this era, um, we're, we're p spending a lot of money and not making as much money. Whereas here, we're making, we're making a lot more money from exports and we're not, and so they greatly exceed imports. You guys with me on that? Mm -hmm. So this is trade imbalance. So right here, London, or you know, let's say it's going out of the port of London. London is losing, if you want to use that term. Here they're winning, right? I mean, winning, losing is a loaded term. Anything look interesting to this graph? Anything interesting about this graph that you guys see? Yeah, so I would say the thing that's really interesting to me is this point right here. Something changed right there. So Dr. Steele earlier said it was probably the French. <laughs> that was probably a war with the French. It's probably a war with the French, right, 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 right. But I don't, I'm really, it's bugging me now. And I, don't, I, don't really know. I don't really know. You should know your history, dude. There was, uh, there was some, something going on in the colonies at the time. I'm not really sure what it was. Yeah, there's but. something happening in the States. I don't know. That the French, is. French and Indian War, but I don't know what that's got to do with Denmark and Norway. But let's let's step back for a second. So this was created by this guy named William Playfair. You should Google him if you haven't heard of him. He basically invented modern graphing, m modern pie charts and line charts. So nobody did this before him. Let me just reiterate this. This guy invented this way of presenting data. He was an engineer and an economist. And what economists did before this was they had ledgers and so they had books and they wrote, you know, plus 14, minus 100 and all that kind of jazz, right? So tabular data. And he decided that, you know, people that read ledgers, clerks, the, the, the bookkeepers, they could understand them. But most people, I don't know, the owners of the businesses or whoever, maybe government ministers, or somebody, maybe they had a harder time. So how can we make people understand what you know this data uh more naturally and so he came up with this relationship and this graph and he did this in 1786 so you know 250 odd years ago before plotly before excel before anything so all the moaning you guys have well, this is so hard to make a graph dude this guy did this with just pen and ink what that's crazy right that's awesome so you guys can make killer graphs as well. And so, so the neat thing about this is you start, to, you guys are making this comment. Oh, hey, this yellow line is bigger than this red line. And of course you in theory can see that in tables, but what we see here is not just that, but the trends are really easy to see. 
it started going up and then something burped around 1725 and it started to, you know, the imports kind of declined and then it really took a dive. The exports exploded after 1755, right? After 1754. So this draws our eye very quickly right to here. Could you look at a table and see that? Sure you could, but a lot harder, right? This, everybody sees that there's, there's the, the red chunk and the green chunk, right? So the value of, of elegant, well put together graphs is that not only can the expert see something going on, folks that are students or new to the field or just coming up or, or non-experts from other fields can still utilize that data. And here we can take away something that wasn't in the numbers, right? This emergent property, there's some switch in the importation behavior of, of uh, trading in England then. Yeah? Cool. William Playfair, check them out. Okay, so really good graphs are gonna have a few things in them. We're gonna go through a couple different suggestions and guides, but to start with, they're data dense. They have a lot of information crammed into a relatively small amount of space. And that allows you to, just like, just like with this figure, that allows you to start to explore on your own without me, without the author of the graph being involved. Next, the conclusion from a, from a you know, well-designed graph is, is pretty obvious. Ah, this is going up, that's going down. It, the inflection point was here, stuff like that. Now, some of you guys will have uh, correlational graphs, but, but a lot of you will have sort of more dependent. Is this variable dependent on that? And if that's the case, it, the cause and effect should be quite clear. The relationship should be clear. In general, you, your figures that you generate will be free of so-called chart junk, which is extra stuff that we don't need, stuff that's gonna get in the way. The automatic stuff that the automated program routines you use just throw into the figure, throw into the space, throw into the legend. Get rid of that and let us focus, hone in on the data. And then thirdly, ideally, it should be elegant. Hard to measure what elegant is, but aesthetically pleasing, easy to read, you know, it looks cool. You don't need to waste a bunch of brain power figuring what's up, what's down. It's, it's well designed. That would be an ideal uh, graph that you guys generate would hit those, hit those bullet points. There's all kinds of wonderful um, sources for guidance on how to make good graphs. Um, one of the guys that influenced me when I was younger, like your guys' age, is this guy named Edward Tufte. And this is uh, the first group of CSUCI brought to one of his traveling uh, symposia. Um, and so this is in downtown LA in 2007. And this is some of your, your, this was Capstone back then. This is the, you know, this is everybody. This is probably Capstone plus Coastal merged together for this thing. There was maybe like two or three students that couldn't come, but everybody else came. So we were smaller back then. But this is uh, Professor Tufty. He was a, a formerly a professor back east and statistician and, and he um, uh, has a bunch of great books that are a really good starter for thinking about how to be more elegant and purposeful um, in terms of our graphing. And so I've lifted this stuff from his seminar. So here's, here's his um, principles for, for well-designed graphical presentations. First and foremost, show the data. So have the data points. If you're gonna have curve fitting and stuff like that, which is fine, as much as you can, also have the raw, the raw data in there whenever possible. Next, we really want to have the focus be on the findings, the conclusions, the data, not methodology, logistics, stuff like that. Sounds obvious, but sometimes we get sucked in that trap. We want to avoid, like that Wall Street Journal example, we want to avoid distorting the, what the data is saying. Right? We want to be honest and fair and objective here. We might we might you know, make it an elegant presentation, but we don't want to do some of that silliness of, of, of having strange binning categories and the like like that. Uh, generally, as much as we can, lots of data in relatively small places help show the trends and the patterns. Another way to say that is have a high data density. Um, want to make large data sets coherent 
want to encourage comparison of different pieces of data. So again, allowing the user to go in and, and take away some of his or, ho, her, his or ho, her own um, hypotheses that they want to test in looking at your data. Lots of detail. Now this is one that's particularly um, easier in the era of online graphics and interactive graphics where you guys can you know, dial farther down inside or dial back outside. We want to have a clear purpose of, of that graphic element. And then uh, next, so Tufty would say have, a closely, have, have your graphs closely integrated with the statistical and verbal description of the data. But I would say, yes, in your thesis, in your poster you're going to produce, right? The text and the, and the figures should be reinforcing. But the test I want to give you guys is that you want to be able to read both separately. So it's, it's stronger to read them both together, but you should be able to read your results section and take away the key points without having to look at the figure or figures. Similarly, you should be able to look at the figure and be able to take away the key points without having to go read your text. So while they reinforce each other, they need to be able to be, um, at least the, the main points need to be able to be taken away in isolation. So that figure should be able to be plugged in your poster or your thesis, the same figure. And then lastly, and this is hard, I don't know how to, how to there's no magic roadmap here, but, but try to be elegant with your presentations. So that's Tufty's principle. Those are Tufty's principles slightly modified by me. So then we get to the question of, okay, so we, we're gonna make our graph. How are we gonna, what, what type of graph should we make? Should I make with this, should I make it that? And there's all kind. there's several different options. First and foremost, let me uh, kill the lights here because this may be a little bit. Don't go to sleep. Don't go to sleep. <laughs> Don't go to sleep. Don't go to sleep. Yes. It's because Matt was doing too much chemistry, clearly. I didn't even know that button was there. I was always <laughs> like, when I went to that panel. It's a learning experience for us all. Oh, yeah, no. So uh, when we're deciding which graphs graphic to, to use, what, and, and I put this in, this is also one of the first steps you should go through when you're thinking about your statistical tests, which statistical approaches are appropriate, is to figure out what are the types of variables that we're, that we're working with, right? And so start off, and it's either categorical or numerical. So categorical, it's, it's you know, dark hair, blonde hair, that kind of stuff, versus numerical numbers. Um, and then each of these guys can be further fractionated, so we get something like dichotomous categorical variables. That would be a yes, no. Let's say you guys are doing a survey, and the answer is yes, I knew of this issue, or no, I didn't. Um, uh, they can be, uh, and they can also be um, ordinal or, or nominal, meaning they could be, um, uh, may, while it might not be evenly spaced, it could be lots, some, none type thing or it could be blue eyes, brown eyes, green eyes type of thing, right? And then in terms of the numerical values, they can either be continuous, which is usually the best, if, if possible, because um, that, that's, uh, we, our statistical tests are, are most robust when we're talking about continuous tests and we have to make the least assumptions. But discrete would be something like integers. So for example, if you're working on, if you're one of Dr. Steele's students working on her microplastics, you're counting one fiber, two fiber, three fiber. When you're counting them, you never get 1.2 fibers, right? Whereas uh, some of you guys that are doing, let's say plant surveys, you might get, in terms of cover, you might get 13.5% um, cover, right? That, that could be a real variable that you get. So that's gonna have implications for both your statistical tests and your graphs. Um, one quick note is that maps, maybe some of you guys are going to generate maps and maybe that's your, your, your key figures are going to be represented spatially. That's totally fine. Not going to spend much time uh, here today talking about that because you guys have, that's really the focus of Dr. Patches or, or Hartman's or whoever's GIS class. Um, I'll just say to remember to fully orient your viewer to your map and just remind you guys that there are different patterns of perception that you guys probably talked about. 
about um, detecting differences, assembling variances, things of that nature. And here's just one quick example. Um, this is uh, an example of folks that uh, passed away from stomach cancer over a 20 year period. And, uh, the, and this is based on counties. So the geographic unit is county. And the, the brighter, the, the closer to the light or white color means the more, uh, the higher mortality uh, rates. And so if we just look at this, do you guys see any pattern in these, in these maps in terms of where folks are getting stomach cancer? What's that? Yeah, where the cheese is at. So up in the Great Lakes area, right? There's a lot of light up there, both with males and females. And New Mexico slash Southern Colorado. Yeah, there's a, there's a, there's a chunk there. A uh, little bit in Southern Nevada, at least for males. Um, less so with females, but yeah, there. Something else going on up in Maine, right? So I don't know, maybe the cold places, people are drinking themselves to death or something, and maybe down in New Mexico there's radiation poison from the atomic test or something, I don't know. But the point is, you guys can start to now take away uh, things from here. Hey, here's a hypothesis. Is this going on? Hey, well, it couldn't just be northern climates because, look, it's not happening in Seattle or vice versa, right? So uh, maps, totally legitimate way to present your data, but we're just going to focus on other things since you guys have had a whole class just on, on maps and mapping. Cool? Okay, these are the most common graphs over the last several years that you guys use in Capstone. So I just want to run through them really quickly. So the first three are different types of, of explorations of the distribution of the data. Uh, and then the next four are uh, uh, relational stuff presenting data. So dot plot is, uh, here's an example of a dot plot. And this is just uh, uh, a single variable and then how many times we got that value of that variable. Very similar to uh, box and whisker plots. In this case, there's more uh, detailed uh, summary statistics. So we'll typically have a, a mean, we'll have quartiles, um, depending on the, the plot used, can be a max or min, stuff like that. So we're looking at the, the range, the distribution of the data. Uh, histogram is another very uh, common one, which is, again, looking at the overall distribution of the data. Is it normally distributed? Does that meet the assumptions of our statistical test or not? Bar graphs are, are the value of, of variable X uh, over time. Uh, scatter plots, um, another uh, very common. Typically, bar would be a category on the bottom, on the X axis. And uh, scatter plots would be um, uh, we're trying to show a relationship between A versus B, where both A and B vary freely. Line graph, very similar to scatter plot, but there's um, a temporal component linking them. So the first one on the left is time one, the next point is time two, next point time three, etc. And then a stacked bar graph is a way of comparing proportional or, or relative amounts of uh, these guys from one group to another group. So let's go, I'll show you guys a little more in depth of those in a second. So if you want to explore the variability, the main thing you guys want to do is, is, is do one of those first three plots I mentioned, a dot plot, box and whisker, or histogram. We uh, look at that with, uh, so for example, on the x-axis here, that's a categorical variable or a categorical grouping. And then a numerical variable on the y. And this helps us see how, how what the distribution of the data is like, um, how much variation is going on, et cetera. And we typically, for any of these plots, we typically either use this or can calculate from this um, measures of central tendency and measures of dispersion. If we want to compare groups, the, the next uh, approach to do that would be a bar graph. And so typically, like in this case, we have category one and category two, and then some numerical variable here. So to compare groups, bar graph is good. To, to show uh, correlation between things, scatter plot would be your default choice uh, just to start out with. If one of the um, variables is time, then line graph would be a good, good way to go about um, the same type of data. 
Uh, if we're going to do proportional comparisons or percentages, again, proportion and percentage is the same exact thing. Percentages is, uh, you know, zero to a hundred percent. Proportional is the same exact data, just going from zero to one. My suggestion is to have all your data in proportional. If you're going to, if you have some kind of um, data like this, I would suggest you have it as a proportion in your data set. All of, most of your statistical uh, analysis, statistical programs will need the data in a proportional uh, uh, format, not in a percentage. So it's better to start with proportional and just use that for your statistical tests, etc. If when it comes time to generating your figure, you'd like to show it as percentage because people seem to like percentage better, uh, some people do at least, um, that's fine. But I would transform it at the last step by multiplying it by 100 to get it into percent. And so I'd leave your raw data as proportional uh, whenever you can. So now in theory, you can do a pie chart. In theory, you can do a, a so-called donut chart, but do not do that. So look at me again. Do not ever make a pie chart in Capstone or anything else for the rest of your career. Should you guys make a pie chart? Should you make a pie chart next year? Good answer. So. Um, stacked bar graphs are superior 99.9999999999% of the time. Virtually every single time you guys will need something because you can more fairly show the comparison and it's easier for folks, as I, as I said, one of the values of this is people can do their own comparisons. They can do their own, well, what if we compare this subgroup with this subgroup? With a stacked bar graph, you can, you can do that. And with a pie chart, you pretty much usually can't. Now, those are just a couple of the most common. There's all kinds of wonderful charts out there, any, any of which are potentially useful for you guys. Um, I would just say that most of you guys are gonna stick to those more basic type uh, charts, but there's all kinds of guides I can share with you guys if you're trying to figure out which, what are some of the options you can, you can do. And again, it's just gonna matter, is this gonna work for my particular data set in this particular context? That it should always be, that should be the driver, not what, Dr. A said or somebody else said. Okay, when it comes time to making your figures, what should you do? What should you add? Uh, should I add, um, well, first and foremost, data. It's gonna vary uh, as to whether you should be putting raw data in there or summary data, and many times you can put both. So you can put all the data in there and then put a best fit line or, a, or an average on top of that or something like that. Make sure to remember to add in your, your labels, in particular your details, what the units were of your measurement. And then, uh, generally speaking, it, whenever is, is, uh, makes sense, and many times it will make sense for your presentation, you wanna have the so-called second order information. So not your raw data, but the trend. Is it, is it an exponential trend? Is it going up? Is it going down, et cetera? And then once we've generated our graph, the next key step is not to just think about what to include, what can I exclude? So now I got my graph and it's looking pretty good and everything. Do I need every single number on there? Do I need every single axis? Do I need that legend? And so then again, just like everything else, we're gonna iterate. So try it with the legend, try it without the legend. Is it, does it help to take it out? Do you need to keep it in, et cetera. Uh, so the last thing here by way of introduction, just want to talk about uh, table versus graph since that's a, um, a table is not necessarily wrong. Table is potentially a, a good way to present your data. So let's talk for a few slides here about tables versus graphs. So here's some data. This is uh, looking at the efficacy of a particular drug. Now the data on the left in tabular form is the same exact data on the right in, in graphical form. So my question to you is, does the drug work? And how do you know it? And which, which, which display on the left or the right did you use to come to your conclusion? So have a, have a stare at that for a second. Did the drug work? What do you guys think? Karina, did the drug work? And so why do you say that? Or, how, or what's your evidence that it worked? So looking at the graph um, on the 
Okay, so okay, so you were you preferred this this side, okay? Yeah, and then I was looking at the the symptom resolution. Uh-huh. So so if you this is a little bit small, sorry you guys, uh, but this is so this is the drug. So this here is the drug, uh, esomeprazole. And the, and the, and then here it's symbolized with the blue symbols, and then here is the placebo. Here is symbolized with the golden uh, coloration uh, um, values. And then the p value is here on the figure and is here in the table. So Michael, did the drug work? And so, how do you know that? So you, you so you preferred this side. And and what specifically were you looking at? Um, I like the fact that it has different colors, so it's kind of easier to see. Okay. And how did you know it was effective, or how did you know the argument that it was effective was a correct one? Oh, because it has a higher value. Okay, so Michael's saying the blue which is, again, this is the proportion of people that, that had their problem fixed, whatever that problem is. So higher is better, right? So this is proportion. So this would be 100% right here. And so they're finding the blue. So Michael's saying generally the blue is higher than the yellow. Now, it's a, it's a bit of an individual choice, but I would suggest you guys, for me personally, that's easier to see here. You can look at this and you can say placebo 67%, okay, and 84%, okay, and 73%, and what's that, 58%. I can do that comparison back and forth and I could come to the same conclusion, but for me, it's quicker and easier to glance at this, yeah? And then um, here, the p-values are all just together. Here, the p-values, the significant difference is they're solid symbols. So they pop out a little bit more. So this is it's statistically significant for acid regurgitation, for epigastric pain, and for heartburn, but it wasn't significant for nausea, bloating, uh, whatever the heck that is, epigastric burning, and epigastric discomfort. So same exact data, quicker and easier for me at least to read over here. So is it wrong to put it in a table? No, but it's probably better if I was if I was deciding between two I'd probably want to go in this form um, there's, a, there's a couple examples well, well maybe not we'll talk about those in a second but does that make sense you guys see what we're talking about same data just presented uh, a little more uh, visually so tables are generally gonna be best when we want to be able to look up specific information so if we knew the exact percentage of rabbits killed by the fire let's say table would be better or, or creating a reference, right? So something we want to um, refer to back in future years. Tables are generally better for that kind of stuff. Graphs are generally better for, like I just said, illustrating trends and for making comparisons, quick comparisons to the, and remember we said one of the things we'd like to do is to be able to allow the observer to, to test his or her own hypotheses, right? To do their own comparisons. Cool. So here are some common uh, questions you guys have asked me over the years about table versus graphs. So, okay, I have an independent and dependent variables and, uh, and they're qualitative or qualitative, what should I do? Generally speaking, a table, no question if they're both qualitative. So if it's a yes, no, if it's a bigger, smaller, and it's a you know, poll question, table is probably the way to go. Um, depending on the number of data points, that's also another uh, distinguisher. So here's an example, a co very common one for you guys. So yes, no, let's say, and here's the percentage to say yes and percentage to say no, lame. Don't make a bar graph out of that. That is something that should go in a table or if literally that's all you have, even just in the text. 30% said yes, 70% said no. We don't need to waste all that real estate saying 30% and 70%. Okay, um, similarly, if we have more than one independent variable, that particularly if the, if the trends between those, or, or the, 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 the trends of those variables differ. 
So for example, here's, here's two line graphs. Look, check out. Here the blue is relatively, it's going up, but it's relatively flat with that group of data. The, perp, the uh, pink group of data is like boop, 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 right? Super, that's much easier to see in graphical form than in tabular form and much quicker. Uh, if we want to represent statistical distribution of data, generally graphical dis display is going to be better. So in the case of this figure right here, here's my line, boop, 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 boop. Then I have this, these error bars up here, a lot easier to see and interpret. And no, it's good. A lot easier to see and interpret if it's a graphic rather than in tabular form. Uh, once we get up to a bunch of different values, generally speaking, a graph is going to be better than a table. Um, and uh, again, trends. So if it's important to understand their overall trend over time, graph is going to be the default here as the best, best option. Cool? Okay. So what, if you guys are going the table route though, here's a couple errors that I frequently see. You want to arrange the data in the table in a meaningful way. So a lot of times you guys will do it alphabetically or you'll do it in the order that you collected the data. And maybe that's appropriate, generally it's not. Generally we want to show it by highest to lowest, by north to south, something, something that makes some sense. So as the person's interpreting the data, again, we're helping him or her uh, along um, with, with the pattern detection. Uh, we want to use uh, rates, proportions, or percentage. Um, in addition to, or sometimes instead of totals, and that's gonna, we're going to need to look at it. If it's your first pass, I would do it both in totals and proportions. And then look at those. Which of those tells me the story more clearly? Uh, similar data should be compared in a downward look. So in other words, listed in columns. So you know, strawberry field A, strawberry field B, strawberry field C, and look at the percentage of sugar, let's say, you know, you know, up or the first row, the second row, third row, that type of thing. It's totally legitimate to highlight, um, you know, a row or, or different elements of rows, right? That comparison, it's totally cool to draw someone's attention to maybe by bolding the values or something, something like that. And then, since a lot of times when you guys use tables, you uh, frequently you do this in sort of a meta-analysis type of approach or, or comparing data from different sources, that's totally legitimate. Just remember to make sure you're identifying the sources of, of uh, data if it's, if it's outside of, of you. Awesome. Let's look at some examples. So this is one of my favorite graphs of all time. I have this in my office at home because I'm a super nerdy, dorky dude. And if you guys ever come into my office, which you all should have or should have already at this point. And you look up right above you, which you'll see, you see a page proof from this Edward Tufte book. Um, and uh, so I like these kind of graphs. But this particular one is uh, one of the most famous graphs of all time. Now, has anybody seen this graph before? Chris has. I think it was, uh, it looked like it was not, I was showing GIS last week. Oh, it could, it could well have been. So this is, um, this map was made in 1869. So again, we're talking, you know, 250 odd years ago, way before Plotly, way before Jump and Systat and all that kind of stuff. So stare at this for a second and then I'm going to ask if someone can interpret this for me or I can interpret it for you if it's too, if it's too confusing at your first pass. Okay, so I, I might need to help you guys out if, if nobody's seen it before and if you guys don't speak French. Okay, so here we go. This is uh, Napoleon's march on Moscow in 1812. So we're starting with a bunch of troops. So the width of this beige line corresponds to how many people were in the army. Now, as we go to the right on this figure, we're moving through time but also we're moving eastward, marching towards Moscow. At this point in time, these guys break off. So this little contingent goes north. And so as we see as they break off, check out what happens. The width of the army shrinks because we've lost that number of people. We keep going, keep going, keep going, a little bit more, a little bit more, a little more. And then another contingent breaks off, so we get smaller. But then have a look. As we're moving here, nobody's breaking off, but look, the width is getting smaller. The width's getting smaller. The width's getting smaller. What's going on? People are dying. Now, they're dying because it's 
crazy cold. They're dying because they don't have enough food. They're dying because they're, you know, just physically exhausted or diseased or something like that. So check it out. You know, I'm going to get you, Russians. And then they're dying. I'm going to get you, Russians. Smaller, smaller. I'm going to get you, Ru smaller, 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 smaller. Get to Moscow. Uh, l look, right? We, even if you don't know the, the exact units, look, we're a, a small fraction of the total force we started out with. Then they get their butt kicked and they run home. So black is the retreat. So now we're retreating, 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 retreating. Re oh, the more die, 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 die. They hook up with these guys and they get bigger for a little bit and they die again. Die, 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 die. So virtually nobody that left returned alive. So here we have number of people, right? It's 422,000 people. That started with, yes. Really? Yes. Something like that, a few thousand. So, peep, num so how many variables here? Number of people, geography. So we're latitude. So these are latitude, longitude, right? So we we have geographic position, lat you know, x and y. Then if we drop down here at this particular point, we're re we're talking about what the temperature is. So we have environmental conditions. We have number of folks we have we have uh you know uh, different units breaking off a tremendous amount of data very high data density you guys can ask some of your own questions here right so this is a really dense data set but i would argue in the, even though it's in french once you get a little bit of orientation very readable very interpretable very much you cut and paste it and mess it around as you see fit. So that's pretty cool. That's Charles Menard's famous map. Here's another more recent example. This is from the New York Times. And now let me orient you to this if you're in the back and you can't quite see all of it. So this is along the x-axis, or yeah, let's start here. Miles driven per capita, so per person in the US each year. So this is 5,000 miles per person, 6,000 miles. So as we go to the right, we're driving greater distances. The y-axis is, is uh, gasoline, price at the pump, uh, price per gallon. So $1.50, $2, et cetera. And then the last little bit, which might be hard to see in the back, these are years. So 1956, 1957, 1958, and so forth, on through time. So have a stare at that. What and I want you guys to tell me what, what pattern or patterns you see in this uh, form of line graph. When the price goes up, people drive less. Okay, so Tra Chase is saying when price goes up, people drive less. So here the price has gone up and people are driving more, right? So here it's three, say call it 350 um, a, uh, a gallon. Here it was, uh, what that was, like two, two, 240 something a gallon. That was like 4,000 miles, whereas over here they're driving 7,000 miles. So not, that doesn't hold initially, but as we go farther, yes, right? Price is falling and we're driving more. So it kind of depends on what phase of the, what era we're in as to whether Chase's observation works or not. What else? What are other observations you guys can make from staring at this graph? Yeah, so check it out. So it's, it's, there's, at some points, it doubles back on itself, right? So that's because we have three variables here. It's not just an X and a Y, it's an X, Y, and Z. So here's three variables plotted, but in two-dimensional space. So sometimes it looks like, Matt's saying, it looks like it, it doubles back on itself. Or, you know, it kind of like, like this guy squiggles back or whatever. Anything else? Anything stand out to you guys? In general, people are driving more as we go forward in time, yes. What about this? What the hell is going on here? Gas prices in the late 70s. Booyah. You guys are too young to remember this. Oil embargo. Gas prices shooting up. You could only buy gas if you had an even or odd numbered license plate depending on the day of the week. So. So we have these 
spikes. Boom, here's one late 70s, early 80s. Boom, here's one in, in uh, late 2000s. So without knowing anything else, I don't even know if this is gas or whatever, just looking at this pattern, we can start to see outliers, things that we can start to ask what, hey, so Chase's observation, hey, I think this is going on. Hey, let's test that, right? So a data dense plot like this, you could go in and look at it and you could explore it yourselves, even without being an interactive graph, even without seeing all of the, the numbers necessarily, you can sort of say, does this trend hold up? So that's pretty cool, I would say. What about this graph? Is this a good graph, bad graph? Tell me what you think. First, stare at it for a second. See if you can orient yourself to it. Okay, good. So we don't we don't know why they switch. Was it because because rules changed or bait changed? But but the result was that a lot of yellow perch were caught in this era, right? And then something happened around about uh, 93 or so. And all of a sudden we stopped catching yellow perch. Maybe they went extinct. Maybe we weren't allowed to catch them. Something happened. And then, and then the catch of rainbow smelt went way up. So again, the good gra de data dense graph is gonna help us see these patterns and test some of these ideas. What, what else? Do you guys like this, the layout of this graph? What do you think? Mm, so I get a vote for distracting. Lisa, what do you say? Lisa doesn't like the shrimp. The shrimp. The fish. I was thinking a third variable might be helpful too, because you see like the rainbow smelt nearly hit zero too. The rainbow smelt, okay, so what would be the third variable you'd want to see? Well, just like another type of fish, maybe they were brought up with something else that year. Okay, possibly, possibly. But let's imagine this is your capstone and this is the data you've collected. So it's always nice to get more data. But, so I've heard you guys don't like the fish symbols. Uh, okay, so let's do a show of hands. Who doesn't like the fish symbols? One, two, three, four, five. Who likes them? Ooh, almost everybody likes them. So that, that's an excellent illustration of the fact that you're never going to be able to please everybody. Right, it doesn't have a title. Good. So we, we, def we could definitely have a title on this figure. Good. But let me stick, on the, stick to this for one quick second, which is that so some of this stuff is just your choice, right? So there's gonna be some initial stuff when you guys make your figures and they're gonna be bad and they're gonna suck and we're gonna fix them. But then once we get past that first little stuff, those little you know, errors that are clear errors, then we're gonna get, and the same with your writing, then we're gonna get in this era of, well, is that the best way to say it? Maybe, you know, there's no magic guide. So it's gonna be, you have to try it out. And so, um, so some of it's just gonna be a judgment call at some point, right? And so fair enough. I would say I personally like the, so firstly, by having it this way, we don't have a legend. So we got rid of the legend, that's good. And then we have rainbow smelt, which is clearly tied with the blue line and the yellow perch, which is clearly tied with the red line. So if I'm showing this to folks that don't know about fish very much, or maybe they're fishermen, but they don't know the, the species names or whatever, right? By glancing at this, they can see these are really different, at least, probably different families if you know nothing else, right? Very different shaped fish. So there's probably some different ecology. And if I know nothing about fish, oh, I, saw, I caught that a long one last weekend. It was probably one of these blue ones. Not that you have to do that, but I, th I think that's sort of an, an inventive way of thinking about how to um, discriminate these, these organisms. But maybe not, maybe you don't like that. Um, uh, so I heard that we don't have a title. Good, we can have a title on here, that would help help orient us, help, help make it clearer. Also year, I don't know if we need to have, it's not, is it wrong to have year? No, it's not wrong, but it's pretty clear. This is 1980, 85, 90, it's a line graph. So it's implying time. I don't think we, you know, we don't need to have Y E A R on the X axis there. And that would give us more space more to play with. Etc. The one weakness here, I'd say we don't have a lot of negative space. We don't have a lot of empty space, which is um, so, a lot of times desirous. Michael. So I think the good thing to add to this one is you might really know where it's at. Like sure. Like sure. So Michael's comment, that could be in the title, you know, so, so Lake Kachuma fish harvest or something of that nature. Excellent. Good. Okay. Make sense? How about this one? 
What? What? So is this data dense is the first question? Yes. yes. <laughs> wow, you violently said yes with that one. Okay, so very data dense. Okay, so that's a good thing. What is it, what is it telling us? Overcrowded jails. So one, it's giving us a, a relationship between, in this case, Brazil to other countries. Change over time. The, what about the population growth of prisons? Are they having babies in prison, <laughs> Matt asks. I think it's just more people arrested. Right. Yeah, so I think it's more, <laughs> more people added to the jail, not birthed in the jail, I think. Although I don't know. I don't know. Maybe there's just a rampant pregnancy going on in 2007 and... Rio de Janeiro jails. I don't know. So, um, but the point here is that uh, this gives you a lot of a lot of data, and you can ask some of those questions yourself. You can go and explore this. So, this is a really data dense graph. We would need some time to to look at it, but um, a lot of data. I would say still elegantly presented. It might look busy to you. But if I would suggest that, you know, so these guys try to help you through this by putting number one, number two, number three to walk you through that. And generally speaking, all things being equal, I want to see more data than less. I'm going to, I am going to be able to communicate more. My audience is going to be able to take away more with more data. Again, as long as it's well designed, well, well, um, you know, spaced out, et cetera. How about this? What's this telling us? Good graph, bad graph, what's it telling us? Probably could have lay, put another land area of whatever, although it says here contiguous 48 states. So it's probably the percent of land area in 48 states, but maybe it could be better about explaining that. Good. What else? Within a really close distance. Right. To each other. Right. So it's saying that, that, that even, even, you know, uh, within a thousand meters of a road, that's you know, more than 80% of the land area. Okay, so good. Have a look right here. Tick mark, tick mark, tick mark, tick mark, evenly spaced, zero, and this is, this is in meters, right? And so generally speaking, what we wanna do is we wanna put our, uh, our variable, the description of the variable in text, and then the units in parentheses. So this is distance from the nearest road, and then what is it, feet, miles, whatever. No, it's in meters. Cool? But have a look at this. Uh, uh, zero, nothing, 2,000, nothing, 4,000, nothing, 6,000. Clearly, this is 1,000, this is 3,000, this is 5,000, right? You guys with me? So I have a tick mark there to help you. Maybe we should have had a, an additional grid line going up here to help you with that. But at least from the labeling perspective, I would suggest we don't need to put 1,000. We don't need to put 3,000. We don't need to put 5,000 here because it's implied. So we can, that last little bit I said, what can we do after we get the graph together? What can we take away? We can take away that, that value. And now it's, there's more negative space. It'll look better. And if we want to make our fonts bigger, we could actually make the zero and the 2,000, 4,000 a little bit bigger and not take away from anything. So we don't necessarily need every single tick labeled, every single this and that. Once you get it good, let's try seeing what we can take away and can we preserve the value and all the, the, the interpretability of the graph. How about this? Stare at this for a second. So is this, is this a clear graph? Does this make sense? So we've not, we've not placed this geographically. Look, here's Belgium, here's Spain, here's Germany, here's Canada. So how are we presenting this data? Right, so it's magnitude, right? So it's, we call this ranked. So we've put the largest value up here, second largest third largest, etc. Yeah? Now, uh, 
do we rank it by light blue? Did we rank it by dark blue? Did we rank it by both together? It's total, right? It's together. So here's an example that you could you could take this graph and, and again, once you guys get your graphs together, we don't know what looks best and what makes the most sense. So I would do this, I would rank it by total. Then I would rank it by just the dark blue values and then rank it by just the light blue values and put those three different graphs together. Maybe they're the same thing, maybe they're different. Which one tells the most elegant, is the most elegant uh, f reporting of the data? Yeah? Okay, cool. Uh, here's one from our, one of our uh, previous capstones. In this case, these are some students uh, uh, looking at um, fish inside and outside the marine protected area. I'll just note here that 20 meters, this is distance from an MPA edge, 20 meters in, 40 meters in, 60 meters in, 100, and overall. So here's a case, again, using bar graphs, where it's not a continuous very, I mean, this looks to be continuous and they're evenly spaced, but overall is not, right? Uh, I'd also note that this says, I've, so this says, this does not say average number of fish per transect, it doesn't say mean number of fish, it doesn't give you any statistic here, okay? So then when I look at this graph, what the heck is this? I don't know what that bar is. What are these error bars? I don't know what that error bar is. It says right here, mean plus or minus one standard error. So the bars are means, and the error bars are a standard, are one standard error, error difference. So here now I have everything I need to know to be able to interpret what these values are. Cool? So it means there's more fish outside the MPA? Yes. Okay. We saw more fish outside, which is what, uh, Kushner and those guys find too, at least Santa Rosa. Um, 